Strategy. Design. Marketing. UX. Digital. Development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, rock on. Here we are. Varun, my friend, how are you? What's new? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just so fascinated every day with this chat GPT thing. Um, you know, every day I'm learning something new. I'm, yesterday, I, I want to share this story to begin the conversation because it is so, so cool. I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Khan Academy. So mm-hmm. I, I watched that TED talk uh, by their founder, Sal Khan. And they showed some amazing things that they're going to launch for the kids and the teachers to learn in the coming months where, you know, in school system, people are actually trying to keep kids away from chat GPT, I'm hearing, but the way they explain they're using and approaching this product, it's going to change the way they will learn. It is not going to just give you the answers, but also teach you how to think about the solution. So the possibilities are so endless and I just can't stop myself not thinking about it and talk about it. Sorry to just just ramble on a little long, but (laughs) who do we have? Who do we have? Yeah, let me introduce our guests. And maybe what we'll do is we'll get through our myth-busting conversation and maybe this will be a topic for for later in the chat, pun intended with chat GBT. Um, Oh, poor. Okay, so today, today (laughs) we have um, an entrepreneur technology expert who also, fun fact that I'm going to start with because I am dying to ask her about how she started her business building race cars and doing engine performance management of sports cars. So for those who know me, I'm a little bit of a car nerd, so I cannot wait to ask about this. So she's got over 35 years of experience in the tech industry um, as a respected leader, helping organizations harness, harness the power of technology. So uh, co-founder and CEO of Spry Digital, Sheila Burkett. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Maybe Super we should excited. start with we should start with Chat GBT. Um, have you used it? Have you played with it? And then we'll get into kind of the meat and potatoes of the conversation. I What's have. Your- I have been playing it. You know, when I write, it's always great that I can ask Chat GPT to edit it for me. And mm. you know, I do the writing and then I have it work as my editor. And it just makes me sound a little bit smarter. So it's taking my words and making it a little bit more concise, which is fun. And I just heard this morning, so you love this. We were talking about a new technology that my team might be taking on for a client. And the developers were like, translate this language, this computer coding language into this other computer coding language. Oh, fascinating and they said it was really fun to see what it would produce and how it would do it so everybody is trying it in different ways I really want to lean into how it can do some of my task automation of the things I don't like so when I elevate and delegate I may be delegating to chat GPT in the future so yeah I mean see this is again amazing amazing use case and that, I mean, if somebody asked me what is keeping me up at night, I think this is a thing that is keeping me up at night of fear of missing out right now, because there is just so <laughs> much going on. And yeah. I don't want to lose this bus. You know, I don't want to uh, not do it. But again, there's so much you can do. It's just driving me nuts because of the endless possibilities. Sorry, just Here's you, you need off. to set some time aside, set some time aside and play. Well, here's a totally different angle with it. I had it, I uh, was playing with it a few weeks ago and I ha- I said, all right, I'd like you to write me a kid's book about, and I gave very specific instructions just to kind of see. And I said, I want it to be rhyming. I want it to be this number of words and this number of pages. And it came up. I mean, it was, the story was pretty basic. It allowed me to give me something to edit and kind of go around. And another angle, I was talking to another friend of mine and, um, 
and uh, she's a nutritionist and she's like, I've used it to build meal plans for people, obviously as an ex, right. And shopping list as an expert, you put in, okay, I have this need. I have these allergies. I have, I hate this kind of food. Can you build me recipes or a meal plan that will help me have this many calories? As an expert, especially anything health related, you need to review them before giving them to a client or something like that. Right. But I was like, oh, that is interesting. Or like, here are six things I have in my refrigerator. How do I make, how do I make three meals out of them? Or, you know, yeah. just completely different use cases out of our, our world of stuff. So yeah. it's, it's um neat and interesting and a little bit freaky deaky, but yeah, I spoke to a group of women of tech on Friday, and one of the questions about ChatGPT was the fear of it taking over tech jobs. And I equated it, this is going to age me back to where we had code generators um, in the 90s, and how much overhead was being created by these code generators. And it was slowing the code down. And I, you know, I said, you know, we've had generations of invasion into taking the tech space away, but as knowledge workers, we're going to have to solve the tougher problems. So what chat GPT will do is it will take the easier task away. So we're solving deeper, harder problems. And I think about it when you think about how disk space, right? How the cost of disk space, the cost of storage, the cost of memory, right? It just allows us to do more and deeper problem solving. So, you know, I, I don't live in fear of it. I live in, as you said, you know, embracing it and how do we kind of move forward and become even smarter than it is. Video change the radio star. How's that yeah, for a little exactly. change? It's no killing, <laughs> just changing, change pivoting. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, interesting. Um, I feel like Varun, we might need to do like a special episode of the podcast, like everyone all in favor of, of AI or chat GBT. And then we'll do a separate one where people are like, uh, uh, you know, that might be an interesting kind of fun conversation, but let's dive into, to our myth busting question. It, we, it, for you, my friend, Sheila, um, yeah. what sort of myth or bogus strategy or misconception do you want to clear up and set the record straight on? So uh, I've had many people along my career tell me that starting a company with um, partners, let alone partners who are married to each other, was a bad move. And I think after 13 years of owning a company with um, my business partners, while it's bumpy sometimes, it's great to have them with you all the way. And it was actually a bonus for me versus a, a a bad move. So I think that's a myth and starting your own business, um, sharing it with others is really kind of what allows you to get over the really hard stuff. How do you, now that you've brought up the really hard stuff, you know, when times are good, it's easy to work together. And I think one of the things that we've asked of quite a few co-founders is how do you make it work? Like, what is it about is it one or two? How many founders do you guys have? Is it? Two? There's three of us. Three. I, yeah. I was going to say, I knew it was, I thought it was more than two. Um, yeah. How do you make that work? How do you, is there a default person based off the area of expertise or how do you manage through the friction? I guess, you know, how do you guys so manage? Originally that? when we started, it was equal. Mm -hmm. And as we grew and as we brought on team members, right, when it was just the three of us, it's easy because you're just the three of you and you're working through those issues. When you start to have more people in the mix, then um, the ownership team um, decided who was going to be the managing partner and the managing member. And that's when I became CEO. And um, I still had, and I had majority ownership. So that kind of shifted that perspective and allowed me to kind of take that leadership role. Um, but we still have in our operating agreement as owners, what decisions I as the CEO get to make and what decisions the owners make and what level of voting has to happen. So it was very clear in our operating agreement down to like level of financial decisions that can be made, hiring types of decisions. All of these things are really clear cut in our operating agreement. And when we're working with the business, it's 
they have roles responsible to me. And we just kept getting clearer and clearer about roles and responsibilities. And, you know, we would have some tough discussions. It wasn't easy all the time. And for a period of time, my husband became an owner in the company. And since we've started, I've also brought on two other partners. So um, it's, it's pretty, in, I mean, I, I completely agree with you on the partnership level. We are also, um, we have been running our company for almost 23 years with three very active partners and one silent partner. But um, the way we have worked is, I mean, and the benefit that we have seen is just having um, somebody to bounce ideas because you are not confident all the time. You need right. somebody to correct you or point out mistakes in your approach and make sure that you, know, you have somebody um, who has, uh, you know, given a second look at the at the decision that you're making yeah so that that definitely goes a long way um however one thing that we have done differently um than what you had described about having a very clear-cut rules and responsibilities i think we we never did that and it is interesting that we have been able to still do i i don't completely agree with having us not do it because I see the need, how it can give so tra- so much transparency, but somehow we have been able to survive for 23 years by just doing, by, by having overlapping roles in many, yeah. many areas, which I don't know why it has worked. I mean, I, I, I always ask this question, like why would it work? But somehow we are able to make it work. I mean, so this is, this is fun, right? Because it allows us to be more flexible, I think, when I look at the positives, it allows us to be more flexible and, and fill the gaps when the other person is not able to do at certain points because yeah. you know, then you are, at the end of the day, you are all owners, you are all entrepreneurs and you have multiple hats to, to wear um, yeah. many times. So that is the idea why you know I think we have done it that way. But anyway. Yeah, I think it really depends on everyone's, decision-making abilities, everyone's maturity in healthy relationships and communications, how they hold themselves accountable. It's it's what it is with hiring leaders, right? In people, you know, it's how you're able to work together healthy. And I think it took a little while for us to get to healthy, where it sounds like maybe you had that healthy relationship and that ability to work through those differences and you know the diverse personalities as we all run into the more diverse the the personalities and the um, learning styles that you have which is great right that's how you get better ideas that that friction that it creates within the organization you have to be able to have those kind of conversations without it being personal and it's more about the work and what we're trying to accomplish and i think those are sometimes why there's there's no cookie cutter right way to organize except for what feels healthy where you're constantly growing you're able to good, make good decisions and you're not um, hurting each other the mutual respect piece, I think, is yeah. another one that, while well, neither one of you have said it, is coming through very clearly um, in terms of your co-founders and how you choose to work with each other. So, right. Yeah. But, I, and you guys do something interesting that we've not talked a lot about on the podcast with other owners. I don't know if we've had anybody that I know of talk about it, but I'd love to talk a little bit about your profit sharing model that you you use internally with employees. You know, is yeah. that, can you talk us through a little bit? How how have you guys done that? How does it work? Oh, it's uh, it's been an evolution in a way. When we did our operating agreement, we redefined it in 2016. One of my goals, uh, I had, put in that at 60, um, which will be in a couple of years now, it's hard to think back then, we thought that was so far off, now it's coming up on that. I wanted a mechanism where employees could not only be owners in the company and share in the profits of the company, but have the ability to earn enough in that space to potentially buy me out and take over owning the company. So with that in mind, and always wanting to have employee ownership and eventually an ESOP. So, you know, it's, you got to start somewhere. So what we did is we created a rubric 
and we define what those decision factors would be. Um, and it has to do with how much, you know, one of the keys is how much they contribute, right, into the company. And are the projects they're on, are they profitable? So based on the profitability of the product, projects that we do, it's based on um, if they're in sales, how much revenue they bring in for the company, if their account management, how profitable their clients are. So every individual, we have criteria around that. And then when you talk about skills and ability, you know, are there, are they, do they have skills that it's hard to find, right? Are they experts in their field? And so all of those weighted, it would always come out, we would start to identify, and it's years of with us also. So we have a part-time person who's been with us 12 years now. She was one of our first people to be offered into this because of her longevity of staying with us. Um, and uh, we do three-year vesting. So they have to continue to be engaged in the company, still be in good standing, all of those things. And then they get um, so many shares, basically like if you're buying stock, they get shares in the company um, and they get to share in the profit that way, but they don't have voting rights. So we have voting members basically in our LLC versus non-voting members in our LLC. So um, we have a second round who vest this summer and so they'll be in their first vesting and we'll look and evaluate every year. We evaluate the team and everyone on the team goes through this rubric. And it's, it's very data-based and my team will wanna throw in emotional. And I'm like, no, this is, this is clear cut. Like they have to have been on projects that are successful. They have to contribute to the bottom line. They have to have been with us. They have to be in, you know, they have leadership responsibilities, indirect, indirect leadership counts. So project managers equal, you know, team leaders type thing, right? Like it's not about you having direct responsibilities and stuff. So um, try to make it as inclusive as possible to make that happen. So I have a couple of follow-ups on that. So First, I want to know when did you start, or when did you start this model, and what inspired you to have the profit sharing model? Like, what caused you that you should do that? So, my career started at Edward Jones, which is a large financial institution that's still privately held, and that model of limited partnerships. So, any employee would be eligible for a limited partnership, and I got my first limited partnership when I was 22, 23 years old. So that having ownership in the company, and then I became a general partner where I had more voting, you know, more responsibility into owning the company. And that happened when I was 31. So I was very young in this model of um, sharing in the ownership and the, the leadership of the company and the profits of the company. So that kind of was where the genesis was, where I always felt like that was important. And as I've done a lot of social justice work, wealth, um, sharing the wealth and people giving them the ability to increase their own wealth was important to me. And the only way to transfer wealth in a company is through the ownership model. And I really wanted to like embrace that and ensure that um, I was sharing the wealth with the people who were growing the company, who made the company successful. So not looking at it as um, a singular person or the owners, we no longer after 13 years are the ones who are making it successful. It's every single human in this company and we want them to share in that success. I, I love that. I love to hear, uh, to hear um, the idea of sharing wealth and giving opportunity for the people to make more wealth beyond their regular paychecks. I think that, that's, uh, that, that idea is so, so good to hear. Um, so on, on that note, so how, so everybody has some profit share um, in the yeah. company, right? Now, apart from that, um, this is more on a process question. Like how do you, um, what, what process do you follow then to help them grow in 
in terms of their base salaries. So like, you know, do you still have the regular, um, you know, yep. process that people have, um, you know, can you talk about So, that? you know, we are moving to a model. We've been working for a couple of years to move to a very transparent base pay model. So every position will have a salary that everyone will know. So if you're a full stack developer, this is your salary and it's one number, it's not a range. So I believe salary ranges continue to create an equitable position. So oh, man. <laughs> not to insert a preference, but there it is. So the reality is if you're being hired to do a job and you qualify for a job, then you should get paid the same no matter what. And if you're not delivering on that job, right, then there's a whole another set of circumstances. Then every year, our goal is to say, we're going to just apply across the board cost of living increase to that. So that position gets a cost of living. If they want to make more money, they can take on, learn more, go move into a different responsibility. Um, so that's one key, obviously helping continue to make the company profitable. Um, and we have kind of mechanisms in place anytime we have a quarter that's over 10% profitable and the next quarter is projected to be 10% profitable, we then take 10% of the profit and distribute it in bonuses. Equitable. Yeah. So, so then it's a, so, so we're, we're constantly looking at how do we create kind of that reward system for everyone that we were successful. And everybody's like, well, what about the bad performer? What if somebody performs better than the other? They're going to gain more title. They're going to have more responsibility. I mean, there's always other mechanisms to make that happen. Um, but I don't, I, I value my administrative assistant who gets me my meetings and keeps me organized equal to my developer who's making my clients happy, right? Like I kind of see they're, if they're doing their jobs and they're doing a really good job at it, it's, it's really kind of to that perspective. But I will tell you that that takes a lot of education with leaders who come in from other places, with people coming in from other places because it's a model that's not embraced across the world, but it's one of, I always put the lens of equitableness and valuing everyone's efforts based on what they're bringing to the table. And that's a different model. It creates a performance review conversation to be actually about performance rather than, you know, uh, am I going to get a raise? You know, having, it's a, yeah, it, it eliminates it's a very that competition internally, right? Yeah. And, and it, yeah, I like it. It, we've, we've talked to quite a few owners who have done not this version, but versions over the years yeah. in terms of the transparency and salary transparency. And, you know, I believe that younger generations that I've seen are calling for it more openly for all the reasons that we've said and haven't said, but it's, it's, it's that we haven't solved the challenge of performance review and how to be able to coach mentor and provide feedback in ways that is actually actionable. And this right. might be a pretty nice step in terms of like people being receptive that saying, look, we're trying to actually help you do your job better outside of the like, yes, you're going to get paid more. No, you're not based off whether you do the thing that you're tasked right. to do or yeah. not having clarity around goals, you know, and things like that, which can also be a challenge within organizations, agency or not. So yeah. um, how does this change your, your hiring model and your, your, you know, talent kind of are people into it to not get it does it help weed folks out what's your experience there a little bit it's amazing um because we talk about this we have blogs on our site and talk about this all the time um in our talent pipeline people who want that full transparency and really want to be valued in a company want equitableness across the board they absolutely are on board and they feel a part of the whole and I think it creates that um, connection that they're looking for 
into their job. Mm. Um, and it's, it, you know, I guess from my perspective, what it gives us the opportunity is we focus on core values and that's our first, we hire to our core values. And that is the first piece. Then we hire towards making sure they are able to fulfill their roles and responsibilities based on what we need them to do. The core values, that is that part of who we are, that DNA part and that compensation part, then just if everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing, if everyone gets it, right, gets their job, then we're all going to be rewarded in our success of, in lots of ways. And does it probably weed up people who may be more competitive and feel like they should always get the biggest, the best? Yeah, probably, but they don't fit our core values because in, in that super competitiveness of let's trample everyone else, let's badmouth someone else, let's make someone else look bad. That is not who we are. And we don't see that as a healthy way of behaving in group in groups, right? That, that, that mentality does not help everyone succeed, so. I, I want to take the conversation about your agency, um, meaning what, what, what do you guys specialize in? What, what is your superpower? What do you guys do better than everybody else? You know, that's, we all say we do certain things, right? Everybody does website development, design, user experience, and those types of things. What we've tried to create is a an environment where we think about with our clients what they're trying to achieve. So we always start at the business side, right? But our three is we always have employees that are from the digital strategy part, the interaction design. We have full stack developers that are part of our team who are used to working together cohesively and working to the client's goals. We always have taken a holistic view of that user experience. Like since day one, we've always said, what is it that you're trying to achieve and how do we help those people achieve it? And our third is we do provide um, ongoing uh, support and maintenance of everything we build. Because when I started, I continue to hear small business owners and mid-sized companies who would have a website developed for them. They had no um, criteria around it. It would just disappear, get it designed, developed, and then they had no way to maintain it. And then it would get hacked and all of those things. And so we try to create this ecosystem where we were helping them and we focus in on that digital experience. If they need help with a marketing plan, we bring in experts to help us with that. If they need execution of the social media, we'll bring in experts for that. But our core is around that digital footprint and how do we help make sure that the online experience is one that you're trying to create that gets it done. Um, we're not focused on, we're not saying we're going to gain you leads. We're going to get quality leads that convert. Yeah. So that conversion part, I, you know, I think some of it is people just want to work with us because they like to have fun. They like to know they're being heard. They like to know that they're being taken care of and we're fully transparent about what we're doing and what we can and can't do for them. And if they're short on budget, we're going to be like, Hey, you're short on budget. You can't do what you're imagining. Let's figure out a way to either get you what you need or find somebody better who can sit, meet your needs. That may not be us. Is there, there's an interesting question we asked another podcast guest, and I'm going to throw this one at you because I'm curious to hear how you would answer it in terms of um, managing clients. You know, they also were finding a lot of the folks that we're chatting with are moving towards being fully transparent and partners versus a right. more traditional agency friction model. Um, you know, how do you manage when clients don't deliver, you know? Because obviously on the agency side, we always deliver or 99% of the time, you know, how do you guys manage the client? You know, and we've had some interesting creative responses from folks and I, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll leave what they were to another episode, but I'm curious how you hold them accountable to say, okay, you owe us this thing or you owe us feedback by this date. How do you guys manage that? I think it's 
constant communication and making sure there's regular, you know, we internally do standups daily when we're building something. Well, if you're not including the client or you're not talking to the client on a regular basis and saying, here's what it is, we use tools like Basecamp to make sure that it's very clear what their due dates are, Mm -hmm. but sometimes life happens and life happens and keeping those communication lines open of saying, okay, this happened. We missed, you missed this. So this is going to impact everything else. So rather than trying to stick to a deadline and say, Mm -hmm. well, we're going to still hit that deadline. If they can't meet the deadlines that happen, we'll either say, okay, how do you need our help? So some, it's always content guys. It's always content. The client's Uh always going to write their own content. Then they don't, they're like, oh, you meant that much content, right? Like, Mm -hmm. how do you do it? So you try to get them to pay you to do that. Um, And when they can't, then you kind of have to negotiate. And it's like, okay, what are you going to trade off? And it's all about trade-offs. And I think if you focus on what their goals are, what their business goals are, and how it aligns with their business goals, if you're not aligned with their business goals and you don't understand their drivers, sometimes teams can get off track with the, what the clients are achieving, but it's yeah. all about getting to know your clients well enough to know, Hey, they have young kids yeah, or maybe yeah. they're taking care of aging parents. Yeah. You're or baking a couple extra days. <laughs> the internal things that they have to meet are crazier. Like we'll try to understand their decision-making process. What is it that they have to do to get to that? And then you bake that into the schedule. So you don't make a schedule in isolation without the client and going, how long does it take you to turn a decision around? Yeah, that's a good tip. I think that's the thing that people forget to ask is like, what's going on over there that we should know about? So we make sure we account for it in case, you know, if we deliver early, great, but yeah. And I I think it's being clear that you can tell us you want it done by this date. But I'm, you know, when I'm in that sales mode, I'm like, I want you to understand, I hear your date, you're going to have to make some Mm trade-offs. Because if that's the thing that cannot move, then there's going to be trade-offs along the way in order to hit that date. If the date can move, but the budget can't, there's still trade-offs you have to make. Mm-hmm. So getting them to really understand they're going to have to make trade-offs along the way, the entire way is really key. Like thinking about those trade-offs because there's, you can't do everything. So I, I'm going to pivot our conversation because I am dying to ask you about <laughs> your race car history. Tell us, how did you get into that? That's where you started. Give us a little bit of a, the insight there and any sort so, of cool nuggets. Hit, hit us up. <laughs> I think that be the first. we've done, you know, close to 50 of these episodes at this point, depending on what order you listen to, you know, it's just, it, I think you might be the first in this industry. Okay. I'll, I'll try to make this fast. So my <laughs> husband's a rule follower and when he, he's a pro, pro computer programmer. So when he was about 27, 28 and he got his first really high paying job, right. He went out and bought a 19, 97, I'm going to get the year wrong, RX-7. Nice, sexy car, right? Very fast. Well, he he's like, I got to find some way to make the car, take the car out and drive fast with it, right? And he wouldn't do it on the streets because that's illegal. Mm-hmm. So he got into racing because drag racing and what they call autocross with Sports Car Club of America. He started doing that, and then he discovered that you could actually race wheel-to-wheel as an amateur, so he decided to build his own race car in 2000. We just had our third child, and that kind of threw us into, he started racing cars, so then I had the choice of, like, if I wanted to see him and spend time with him, I needed to to go along, so I started helping, I was kind of his pit crew learned how to do all of those types of things. And then he's like, come get your race license. And so we bought, we bought me a race car and I got a race license. And this was all while I was still working at Edward Jones. And um, so when I hit my 20 year mark and I was kind of bored and found out I really had this entrepreneurial spirit, he had already quit his 
really good paying job to go build race cars for fun. So he goes, why don't you just quit your job and just come help me build this business? <laughs> and so I did, <laughs> threw my career out and said, okay, we're gonna go build this business. And so as I do with lots of things, I learned everything I could about building race cars. And we both being technology geeks, decided to buy a um, dyno, which is what measures horsepower in cars. And we started um, uh, really working in that engine management system, computer programming to change um, the way the system works so that you could get more horsepower out of your cars. And so we'd have these dyno days and we'd have a hundred people show up to watch us literally tuning cars. <laughs> it was the craziest thing in the world. And, uh, that's, you know, that's kind of how I did it. And we got into it. So I just looked at a car, like a computer and there are pieces and you had to learn what pieces work together. And you just, you know, I learned all about how to put in transmissions together and, all these kind of crazy things. Yeah. Had a race team. It was fun. Tell you decided that me making this a business was not quite what we really thought we were going to do. So we went back to school. <laughs> so, so we wound it down. Um, I, I still have uh, the ability to put on national events and I'm a registrar to do um, all the legal stuff of making sure you can race cars. I kind of stepped back out of that over the last couple of years, but um, yeah, he still plays with his cars. He's got a brand new vet and he keeps telling me to come out and do it. And I'm like, I just really don't want to do that anywhere. That's not where I want to spend my time. <laughs> After so, 20, so like 20 some years. So what yeah. motivated you to start the, the agency then like from racing to agency? What, how, <laughs> how does that happen? happen? <laughs> so I discovered I probably wasn't employable to go work for anyone else. And I was like, I just don't want to go work for anyone else. So I started I taught myself how to install um, four different content management systems, Drupal, Joomla, .NET Nuke, and WordPress. And I started uh, consulting myself with small business owners, spinning up websites, doing their, getting them set up in Google, doing their ad buys, whatever it was. And, you know, I had 20 clients in like a year and a half and you know, if you're trying to manage 20 clients on your own, that's exhausting. And at the time, my business partners were talking about wanting to start their own agency. And we got to talking and I was counseling them because I was doing a lot of coaching and mentoring of business startups. And one day I was like, you know, I need help. They want to start a business. Maybe we should just do this together and pulled the trigger in 2010 and said, let's just go for it. And let's you know, come together. And that's how it all started. We just were like the three of us were going to, there was four of us originally. And after a couple of years, one backed out, but we just like, we're only going to sell what the four of us can do. That's, that was our goal, right? It's how we all start, right? We're only going to sell what we can do. And then, it, you know, you get that next big project and then you got to hire people and then you get the next big project and then you got to hire more people on it. Now I have 28 yeah. people. <laughs> it's like, where did that happen? Like, how do you get to that point? I, I can so much relate to that. Starting with sell what you know and then just keep building from there. Um, that that's so cool. So where where do you um hang out? Like where do you get your um learning about the industry, about the agency space? Your, you know, you, you may have you know coaches and mentors along the way. So where you where do you get your um, where do you stay up to date with the other agency owners? You know, I've been in a couple. There's a, a there's actually a Facebook group. It's part of AIM, and it's Build a Better Agency. And I love following all that and talking to other agency owners. I do a lot of networking, in, especially in St. Louis, and I have met a lot of agency owners along the years. We partner together, you know, you find people who um, don't do exactly what you do, need your skills. So, you know, we in St. Louis all network together and talk and share ideas. Um, I became a part of Together and Together Digital in 2017. And that is a community of women who are let several agency owners. And now I mentor two women out of um, that group who are agency 
working to be agency owners. So, you know, it's like you, you just build this network and you start talking to people, but together digital, I think was one of the great things because you got to talk to not only agency people, but people who are in the business. So it was all of us coming together and really kind of learning from each other. Oh, this is what the, the, company side once, and this is what the agency people are doing. Um, I've also been, I was a uh, part of Vistage for five years. Mm-hmm. And so that from a business perspective, and then I've been in the Inc 5000 community the last year. Um, so, and we're an EOS company. So that's the entrepreneurial operating system and our implementer connected us into that network. So when I'm talking, there's a lot of agency owners in EOS. So I've connected with a lot of people through those networks too. Yeah, that's so cool. Connecting, together connecting, digital, connecting. <laughs> together digital sounds so much like together we ship, which is our brand. So yeah, I, I like, yeah. like to hear that too. So yeah, good. Well, this has been a great conversation, Sheila. Thank you so much. We have one last question for you. Yeah. What, um, well, what's exciting you about the future? Ooh. And um, I know we've already talked about- uh, We talked about chat GPT. I, <laughs> I think that's pretty exciting to see what that will evolve into and really how do we leverage it for good, mm-hmm. right? Um, and control it from- as the fear mongering continues to happen of it's going to take the world over and it's going to do all these bad things. Um, I watch a lot of science fiction and I still don't buy it. So, you know, I, I feel like uh, that's probably the most exciting part. Um, I am, I am really excited about the younger generation. So, you know, I'm a Gen Xer and I raised kids who are in the, the millennial and Gen Z and they just energize me. And the, the, those individuals, and you guys are probably in that, have, are changing the world for the good in so many ways. And that gives me so much hope that as we continue to embrace those generations of giving them and seeing them um, really kind of take the world into a whole new place so that you know that's not you know in that space but really kind of forcing us to rethink the old ways and be new and energizing so well that's a that's a good answer (laughs) thank you guys for having me on this is so fun I really appreciate you inviting me to do it so thank you for being here and uh, where people can find for those of you listening we can find Sheila is uh, spry digital spry digital.com and on LinkedIn as well so that's it thank you so much that's uh if you learned something today or laugh tell somebody about the podcast have a great day Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.